Shall we rise up, please? Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our God and our Father, we bless your name for bringing us together for this special church growth seminar. We're asking that as we're here together, your hand will be mighty upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. We have come here to be able to have an insight into the great work you've committed into our hands. And we pray that no matter how successful we have been in the various fields of endeavor in your work, that you'll still open our eyes to what we have not known yet in Jesus' name. Amen. We rejoice to confess before you that we're happy to be called of you. And yet, Lord, we know that we need your power, your enabling, to be able to fulfill that call. And so we pray that as we're here this week, all that we need, your supply to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Energize and empower us yourself. Amen. Give us all that we need Amen. so that your work will be successful in our hands in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that no stone will be left unturned Amen. and everything that has been a hindrance to progress or success in our personal ministries and lives, you will expose, you will remove in Jesus' name. Amen. Speak to our hearts yourself. Amen. And we pray that in our personal devotions and personal study of the word, during the time we'll be here, you reveal deep things to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Give us the ability to do this work successfully. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is the first time we're having such a seminar like this since we started having our regular Sunday worship, having pastors, teachers and ministers in our various branches all over the nation and also in our foreign fields. The seminar we're having this week is different slightly to the workers retreats we've been having. We're going to be slow in the things we pass across and um, there are a lot of responses we'll be requiring from you. When the uh, programs eventually come, you'll see that we're demanding a lot from all the participants. The program, the normal program is there. Then there are evaluation forms to be filled every day because we want to be able to monitor how you are benefiting, how the whole day is being spent. Then also there are other forms for you to fill. And um, those forms will collect them uh, at the end of the program and we'll go through them as if we're going to mark examination papers and then after that we'll pass some comments there uh, so as to be able to help you on individual personal basis depending on uh, what you have filled in those forms so when we return them to you it will help you to be able to really have a grasp of the principles we're teaching this week Tonight, uh, I'll talk to you on vessels of honor. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and verse 21. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth and some to honor and some to dishonor. Kings in those days were known to have great houses and in those houses they had, they had vessels, 
treasures. Instruments that were very useful to them. And in such houses, there were some instruments of wood, some clay pots, some of gold, some of silver. Because of the different materials of which these vessels were made, they were put to different uses. And here Paul the Apostle was reminding Timothy in particular and other Christian workers as well that we should see ourselves in the kingdom or in the house of the great king. And it's a great kingdom, a great house. Then we see ourselves as instruments in God's hands. But then we understand that we as instruments or tools or vessels will be, of, will be made of various materials. Gold or silver or wood or clay. And then the apostles said that some of these materials were used for honorable purposes. Others, they are just there to be able to bear the refuse within the household. And obviously from the writing, the apostle was encouraging each one that will read to aspire to be vessels of honor. The question then is, what makes a man a vessel of honor and makes another man a vessel to dishonor? In our minds, we must correct the erroneous um, idea that God has decided what type of vessel I will be so that we're laying the blame of our failure upon God. Or sometimes we feel that our success or failure depends on which area of the house we are. Again, that is wrong. No matter what part of the house we are as vessels or instruments, we can make the choice to be successful, to be vessels of honor. Or if we become vessels of dishonor, it's our choice. That's implied in the writing of the apostle. Which means then the choice is ours. And right at the beginning of this conference or seminar, I want you to begin to picture what type of vessel you want to be, what type of man you want to be in the work of the Lord. How much do you want to actually do for the Lord? What type of success do you want? What goals do you have in your life? How honorable will your vessel be at the end of the day, at the end of the service? We'll briefly go through the chapter and see what makes an individual a vessel of honor. And um, you don't have to talk too much about what makes an individual a vessel of dishonor because if he's not aspiring or endeavoring to be a vessel of honor, he'll be in the other category. So what makes you and I to be vessels of honor? In verse 19, point one is that we must be sure of our relationships. One, relationship with God. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. We must find out within our own bosom, within our own hearts, if we are rightly related to the Lord. Because to become a vessel of honor, we have to be very definite about the fact that we belong to him. And because we belong to him, he will be willing to use us. And before we can belong to him, we must have departed from iniquity. There are general sins that we have shunned or fled away from as Christians. 
All these things must not be allowed to come back into our lives. But then as ministers of the gospel, we should begin to study the lives of the men that have aspired to be vessels of honor and see the types of sins or weaknesses or the type of uh, iniquities that still clung to those ministers or the great men of old. Examine the life of a man like Abraham. Do you feel or do you see that you have some tendencies? That if you are not curb those tendencies and if you are not deliberately depart from that peculiar weight or the sin that does so easily beset, do you find that you might have the same problem as Abraham had when under pressure to get into the iniquity of deceit? Think about great men like David. Do you find in yourself that your body is so constituted that at an unsuspected moment, at a time when all the other workers have, been, have gone to the work, at a time of relaxation, do you find that your mind wanders, your eyes wander, and your feet roam around? To the point that you get into trouble with women. Think about people like Samson. And think about people like even Peter. And make sure that your relationship with the Lord is kept secured. That's the very first thing you must think about. If you are going to be a vessel unto honor. Remember that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. And um, as the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro, is looking to see the people whose hearts are perfect before him. Now, in verse 20, But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold, of silver, but also of wood, and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor, you must be a purchased vessel. That means the Lord has definitely, deliberately purchased you and he wants to put you to good use. But from verse 22, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Number three then, we must be pure from youthful lusts or sins. Number four, we read verses 23 to 26. But... Foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If, peradventure, they will give them, um, if peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You must maintain wise human relations or relationship with the outside world. Wise human relations or relationships with the outside world. You mustn't strive you must avoid controversial, unnecessary, unprofitable questions. You must be gentle to all men. You must keep yourself under the control of the Spirit of God every time. Then we go to verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, 
the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This is a great tool for church work, knowledge of doctrines. You must establish that within yourself that you will have a good grasp of the knowledge of doctrines of the Bible, the great redemptive truths, the truth about Christ, and the knowledge on church work, not only doctrines, but basic good knowledge on church work. From verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that worrieth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is see not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Number six, you must be tactful. You must be bold as a soldier. You must be tough, a tough-minded individual. Not a person that is plagued with self-pity. You touch him in a little part of his life, he becomes so sensitive, easily cries, is not able to endure hardness as a good, disciplined soldier of Jesus Christ. From verse 6, The husband man that laboreth must be a false partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. You must be a partaker of all that Calvary has purchased. Partaker of the fruits. Examine redemption thoroughly and see what we have as we are in Christ, as we are dead with him, buried with him, raised with him, seated together in heavenly places with him, what we have as a result of the blood of Jesus Christ, what we have as a result of his victory on Calvary, be partaker of those fruits, all that Calvary purchased. These are things that make you and I vessels of honor. From verse 11, it is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. We must be dead to sin as Christians, but now as ministers, we must be dead to negative comments, criticism, and... Um, suffering. We mustn't allow anything on the outside to touch our spirit. Then, verse 14. Of these put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about what to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Avoid open religious strife and unprofitable controversy. Verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be diligent to seek God's approval on all you do and on your whole life and comportment. We'll stop here today, think about these ten points I've given you, and examine whether you already have them in a small measure and you need to develop them, or you have not been uh, thinking about them before, and you want to really look up to the Lord, so there will be a real relationship with the Lord, you are sure of your call to serve, you are purchased for service, you are pure from youthful sins or lusts. You maintain a wise uh, human relationship with the outside world. 
You have knowledge of the doctrines and church work. You are bold, tactful, and tough. You are a partaker of all that Calvary purchased. And then you are dead to sin, negative comments and suffering. You avoid unprofitable controversy, open religious strife. You are diligent to seek God's approval on all you do, on your whole life and comportment. Well, rise up and talk to the Lord on these points and plead with him that by his grace he'll make us vessels unto honor. Let's rise up and pray. message today on being vessels of honor and we have been told what type of worker do we want to be do we want to be successful or do we want to be failures my brothers my sisters we ought to face the Lord this very moment and really lift up our voice to pray that the Lord will remove from us anything hindering and to make us vessels unto honor. We are told the choice is ours. Let's seek the face of the Lord.
Father in heaven, we present ourselves before your throne of grace. We have come here with emptiness in our hearts. We have come here with questions in our hearts. We have come here to find solutions. How we can become vessels of honor. <coughs> How we can be used of you to reach our generation for you. The challenges are before us every day. From wherever we have come from, whether far or near, Almighty God, we are asking ourselves, how can we do it? In our hearts and on our lips is the question, what shall we do that we might do the works of God? Day after day, we see the plight of men and women before us. Souls hungry and destitute <coughs> of the truth. <coughs> and saying, what shall we do? Some of them come and we find no answer for them. And our hearts are grieved. But we thank God, Lord, you've called us. And this is the right time to have such a seminar like this. Father, we have come and we are emptying ourselves before you. We don't know the way. We want us to show us the way. We want you to open the door unto us. And whatsoever you will have to keep away from our lives. Remove from us in Jesus' name. Father in heaven, from the depths of our hearts, we have come here for serious business. Whatsoever will hinder us, remove fire away from us in Jesus' name. Let our attention, let our prayers, let our thoughts be focused on you. Mighty God, empty us. Empty us. By our choice, we want to be vessels of honor. Yes. So, Father, wherever we are now, make us vessels of honor in Jesus' name. Yes. Father, by your Spirit, create in us. Amen. Create in us Amen. a thirsty heart, Amen. a hungry heart. Amen. 
and that will not leave you until we have touched you. Yeah. And by the time we leave this place, like Elisha the prophet, we will say we have seen the king, we have seen him. Yeah. And then we will go back to our river Jordan. And we will strike with a mantle and say, Where is the God of Elijah? And when we speak, the people will say, The Spirit of the Lord has come upon them. Father, this is what we want. This is what we are looking for. And Father, we are sincerely and seriously praying for your servant and son you are going to use to speak to us. Feel him. Feel him. Feel him. And let your words pour forth to minister to us. As we go for tonight, let what we have heard lay the proper foundation in our hearts for all that we need to receive from you. Thank you, Father, for tonight. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If I walk the pathway of duty, if I walk till the close of the day, I shall see the great King in his beauty when I have gone the last mile of the way. If for Christ I proclaim the glad story, if I seek for his sheep gone astray, I am sure he will show me his glory when I have gone the last mile of the way. Here, the dearest ties we must sever are seen every day, but no sickness, no sign forever when I have gone the last mile of the way. If here I have earnestly striven and have tried all his will to obey, it will enhance all the rapture of heaven when I've gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I will rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys awaiting me when I've gone the last mile of the way. Thank you.